Welcome back everybody to another Motobob video where today you join me in Spain for the launch of the Honda NT1100. Now let me start by telling you what this bike is not. It's not a 160 horsepower super quick sports tourer. It's not got the latest and greatest fancy Brembo brakes. It doesn't have electronically adjustable semi-active suspension and it doesn't even get the six axis IMU from the Africa Twin. This is much more of a bike that traces its heritage back up to the Pan-European and the DeVille. So for £11,999 for the manual version, £12,999 for this DCT, instead of all the fancy electronics and sporty equipment, you actually just get really good practical standard gear. But in this quest for comfort and practicality and versatility, have they actually ended up building something quite boring? Well, thankfully, we've done plenty of miles today, lots of riding up in the hills here in Spain. And so in this video, we'll go through each of the main categories that I rate the bike in. And at the end, I'll tell you who I think this bike is perfect for. So let's start with the engine and no big surprises here because it's pretty much the same engine as the Africa Twin. So it's an 1100 parallel twin with a 270 crank. Now they have changed the intake ducts and the exhaust system, but ultimately the engine itself, you know, you could swap it directly into an Africa Twin and you'd notice no difference. Peak power is 100 horses and peak torque is 104 newton meters. And the big question I guess is, is that enough for this type of bike? For me, it's an engine that has always exceeded what it looks like on the spec sheet. It's really nice in the middle range super smooth lively when it gets up to around 6,000 revs where it makes that peak torque and yeah I thoroughly enjoyed myself on the Africa Twin last year and same story here I was wondering whether if you bought one and then got six months down the line you might be wishing that you'd bought something a little more powerful but I went on MCN they have customer reviews at the bottom of their reviews and I looked through all the Africa Twin 1100 customer comments and I couldn't find anything that suggested that people wanted more power there's just loads of glowing comments and so of course I'd expect the same reaction from customers of this bike. A couple of other positives to note, fuel efficiency is decent and then you get that 20.4 litre tank so those two factors combined you should get a range of around 250 miles. The other thing is the gearbox configuration so you can get the manual bike just bog standard with a clutch. There's an accessory for a quick shifter so if you want to do clutchless up and down shifts you've got that option or you've got DCT it's a thousand pounds on top of the standard bike so you can ride it basically like an automatic or you can take over with the paddles on the left hand switch gear or you can put it in manual mode and just use those paddles. There really is something for everyone. I think personally I'd go for the quick shifter. The handling was perhaps better than I expected and so I'd like that sort of sporty nature when I was pushing the bike a bit. All in all it's a massive plus for me this engine. I really liked it in the Africa Twin. I like it here as well and I think you know if you put off demoing one by the spec sheets just go and swing a leg over one and see how you get on with it. Now like I said I really got on with the handling on this bike. It's not completely unfamiliar. The frame is again pretty much the same as the Africa Twin, same frame, same subframe, just with a few tweaks that make it that much better for road riding. First up, the steering head angle is being sharpened up a little bit just to give it more responsiveness and agility. They've shortened the suspension as well as 150 mil of travel as opposed to well over 200 on the Africa Twin, I think. Again, just sharpens things up, gets the bike a bit lower and removes some of that wallowiness that you get with pretty much all adventure bikes. 17 inch cast wheels, which are much better for the road. I mean, you've got less unsprung weight. They change direction better and then Metzler Road Tech tires I think there's a Dunlop option as well but front end feel on this bike is way way better than the Africa Twin. Brakes are the same as the Africa Twin so four pot radially mounted Nissan calipers on three 10 mil discs I believe and look it is a touring bike it's not a sports bike and it's 238 kilograms in standard setup and then 248 with the DCT so that adds 10 kilograms it's never going to be like a track day weapon but if you just want to ride at a sort of moderate to quick pace it feels perfectly good it's got a nice balance of stability on the motorway but also on the twisties in the mountains here plenty of fun the suspension impressed me as well i mean there's not a great deal of adjustability there's a remote knob for the preload on the shock and then there's preload adjustment on the fork so that's great if you're going to take a passenger and luggage to get both set up and get the sag of the bike right but yeah maybe you'd expect some damping adjustment but i would
will say I haven't really thought about the suspension all day it's never seemed too harsh it's never seemed too soft and cushy and wallowy and so I'd say not having noticed it is almost the best thing I can say for a bike like this all in all you know it does have its limitations it's based on an adventure bike it's an upright position and it is fairly weighty but for what it's intended to do it certainly does the job and I've got to say this thing is super duper comfortable first up the wind protection I mean look at this screen it is a little bit tricky to adjust you can't do it on the bike both hands you gotta hop off and do it but it goes up or down by about 16 centimeters so there's a really big range Oop. in fact you can probably also see how when it's down it's raked back a bit but when you put it up it stands up and that really changes the airflow around you. I'm about five foot nine and for me with it in this up position on the motorway at 70 or 80, it's perfect. If I duck my head just that little bit, I'm right beneath the screen and it's super quiet and very, very comfortable. The other bits of wind protection are pretty smart as well. These little deflectors or wings there seem to protect your hands a bit and push the air up over the shoulders. I can just feel it kissing the shoulder here and that's exactly what you want. You don't want a big bulbous front end, but if it can just push it around your body, you feel that bit warmer you know the fairing's fairly substantial here and then you've got a little bit of a rib that pushes the wind around your knees so you can tuck them in and then you've also got some lower deflectors here again keeping some wind off your legs but also keeping your feet a little bit drier as well all morning we've had drizzle on and off and i was wearing a rain jacket earlier but i've not had waterproof trousers on just jeans and i'm bone dry now the only bit that's wet is the back of my boots with the spray from the rear wheel this particular bike has the comfort seat accessory nice Nice and wide at the back, narrows at the front, 820 mil, so very accessible. And then you've also got 60 mil of padding on the passenger seat, some decent grab rails. And they've even shaped these side cases so that they're not in the way of the passenger and slung the exhaust nice and low as well. You know, looking at the side cases, you can see that they're quite long and deep, but fairly flat. And they've done that to keep the bike narrow. So more aerodynamic, better for filtering, but also when the passenger climbs on, a little bit easier to get on. Foot peg position is absolutely fine. And then the bars I really like what they've done here so they're nice and wide but they've also moved them a little closer to the rider versus the Africa twin that bike you might want to take it off-road and stand up so you don't want it to be too close but here I mean realistically most people aren't going to be off-road in this bike or I certainly hope not and so yeah they're just that little bit closer very very comfortable and I think overall I'd rate this bike excellent for comfort especially because of the wind protection I said to the guys earlier the uh, development guys from Japan it's like a baby gold wing now look for the tech and features like I say there's not a great deal of advanced rider aids lean sensitive stuff but realistically on a touring bike especially a traditional style touring bike like this do you really need it I don't think so there's enough to play with there so you get three riding modes rain road and wait no rain urban and tour and then two user modes and with those you can affect throttle response engine braking traction control level I think they also tie into the DCT and look when I'm changing between modes I'm normally doing it for the throttle response if it's really wet and hazardous you might like it to feel a little more dull otherwise I don't think there's a great deal else that you need now I publish loads of videos about the specs of touring bikes and I just think they've used what budget they had to build this bike to really focus on hitting those key points points that come up for me time and time again. Cruise control as standard is just an absolute must for pretty much most people on touring bikes now. Heat, it grips as standard. You know, they could have easily charged a couple of hundred quid for fitting those, but it's great that they're standard on a bike like this that you realistically want to be able to ride in any weather conditions. Luggage as standard, they're 63 liters combined, I think. Very decent, nice looking, well designed and really easy to get on and off. The center stand I already mentioned as well. I can't believe how many comments I get about those. Either that people are annoyed that you have to pay for one as an accessory or on a lot of bikes now you know the fact that you can't get one accessory or otherwise if you're not going to get a shaft drive on a touring bike like this i do agree that it's great to have that so you can easily maintain the chain and lube it and clean it 12 volt socket in the cockpit is great usb socket in the cockpit great as well so you could have your own nav here if you wanted or you could wire up your heated gear to the socket but then you've also got this really good and clear tft display now there's bluetooth connectivity to your phone so you can handle 
little calls and music through your headset, but also you've got CarPlay and Android Auto. That means you can use your favorite navigation apps and it's touchscreen as well, so you can really interact with it in much the same way as you do your phone or CarPlay in a car. Honestly, once you've tried CarPlay, I mean, it really is good and I use it all the time in my car, so it's great to have it on a bike. My only complaint is that the USB socket is here on the dash. That means you're gonna have to find somewhere to put your phone on the bars or something, and then once you've mounted your phone on the bars, it's kind of like, well, what's the point in having CarPlay, because I've already got it there. I'd like to see a socket and stash under the saddle like the Tiger 900 has. That way your phone's tucked away safe and you've still got the benefits of your favorite apps and nav and media and messages and all that stuff right here on the dash. It really does hit on pretty much all of the main points and the accessories catalog, I mean, you've got a top box, you've got comfortable pillion footrests, you've got the quick shifter, you've got a tank bag, but there's not a great deal left there and the main stuff that you want is all here on the bike. So from the perspective of a touring motorcycle, I'd have to say I'd rate this pretty good for the features and equipment. Now onto the looks and desirability, and it has to be said, they have been a little conservative with it, especially with the color options. So you've got white, gray, or black. It's a shame there's no Honda red to liven things up. There's echoes of the XADV at the front end, and then the rest of it, you know, it's not super exciting, but it's not particularly offensive either. Weirdly, in the press briefing last night, they showed some of the renderings of the bike as it was going through development, and it looked, it looked kind of stunning. And that had me wondering, with the bike on the stage next to it, I was like, what's the difference? Why has it not just got that extra bit of je ne sais quoi? Obviously, stuff like mirrors and indicators and homologation stuff does affect it, but I think one thing is that looks a little bit more sporty, and then Let me have a look on the camera. See, that looks better, doesn't it? It looks a bit sharper. I like that a lot more, but realistically, most people are gonna be running it with the panniers on, especially because they're standard fit. But overall, I think I have to rate it as sort of average for looks. It's not stunning. Like I say, it's not particularly offensive, but let me know what you think of it down in the comments. So onto the price and value for money. And like I say, for the manual bike, it's 11,999. And then for the DCT, 12,999. There are a lot of good bikes you can get for 12 grand. I mean, the main one that jumps out is the Tracer 9 GT, almost exactly the same price, a little bit more sporty, perhaps less comfortable, but I reckon definitely one to also check out if you're thinking of buying something like this. But what I will say for this bike is it really does hit on a lot of those big things for touring riders. You've got the Honda build quality. You've got that Africa twin shaft and engine. And look, against the Africa Twin, I think it looks like good value. So I'd rate it pretty good. I think 11999 is less than I was expecting it to cost when I heard about it before it launched. And with that, you know, it is going to appeal to a certain type of rider. If you like to fill your eyeballs, hit the back of your skull when you get on the gas. Probably isn't the bike for you. This one's for the gentleman tourer, the one who appreciates comfort, good features, practicality, versatility. And for that, I think it really hits the mark.